This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. May 9, 1986, Arizona State Prison. Patrick Michael Mitchell and two cohorts stage a daring escape in broad daylight. Since then, Mitchell is suspected of robbing five banks of nearly $1 million and has earned a spot on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. 60 years ago in Ohio, an eight-year-old farm boy was disowned by his step-parents and left to fend for himself during the Depression. Today, Victor Scheinman is still looking for his real family and needs your help. From Nevada, an eerie tale of two families and one haunted house. One of the families claims they took this picture of a benevolent ghost. The other family claims that their spirits tormented them. Also, the FBI is asking for your help to track down a master con man who is suspected of brutally murdering his wife and two stepdaughters. Join me. Perhaps you can help solve a mystery. December 14th, 1987, 8.30 a.m. Nobody move! Just put your hands up, there's no one will get hurt! Two men, wearing Ronald Reagan masks, held up a bank in Gainesville, Florida. Keep your hands up! The bank had not yet opened no for business. Employees were marking in the weekend deposits. In less than five minutes, the two robbers made off with nearly half a million dollars. Working with similar MOs, the FBI targeted Richard Joseph Landry, alias Michael Garrison, alias Roger Lanthorne. They all turned out to be the same man, Patrick Michael Mitchell, one of the most skilled bank robbers in the country. During the last 15 years, his heists have netted close to $3 million. Patrick Michael Mitchell is an escape artist, a master of disguise. He changes identities like most men change shirts. Each time he robs a bank, he wears a different comic mask. Ronald Reagan, Richard Nixon, even Bozo the Clown. The FBI believes the mask of Mitchell's way of thumbing his nose at authority. Today, after 14 bank robberies in the United States and Canada and two prison escapes, Mitchell is the newest addition to the FBI's 10 most wanted list. I guess you could best describe him as being uh, confident. He's even uh, vain to a certain extent, and that uh, we believe him to have taken the prescription drug of uh, Retin A, which uh, supposedly helps your keeps your youthful appearance. He's uh, been described as having an athletic build. He likes the ladies. He fancies himself as a gourmet cook. A matter of fact, we've even recovered some cookbooks from the trunk of one of his cars. So far, we've developed at least 25 different aliases he's used in the past 11 years. In 1983, Patrick Mitchell was given a 20-year sentence at Arizona State Prison for bank robbery. On May 9, 1986, he and two other prisoners assigned to janitorial duties staged a bold escape. It had been meticulously planned and precisely timed by Mitchell himself. None of the guards noticed that the three men were missing. No alarms had been set off. Wearing street clothes they had hidden in a utility room, the three convicts simply walked outside.
A girlfriend of one of the prisoners was waiting for them. She had been duped into believing that the men were on a weekend furlough. The escape went off without a hitch. One of the men would eventually be arrested in Atlanta, Georgia. Patrick Michael Mitchell, with a third escapee, Johnny Salazar Stewart, headed for Gainesville, Florida. They come into a town a month or two in advance. They come in on several occasions, stay at local hotels and motels. We believe either by staking out department stores or armored car services, they then determine when and where they will make their hit. The way I see it, armored car gets there between 8.15 and 8.20. We'll watch them go. In the fall of 1987, Patrick Mitchell and Johnny Stewart began planning a robbery in Gainesville. Three minutes. Mitchell rented a self-storage unit with a good view of both the bank they intended to rob and the armored car company that served the bank. Mitchell pretended to load and unload boxes from the storage unit while he observed the routine operating movements of the armored car company. Patrick Mitchell never went inside the bank himself. Instead, he sent Johnny Stewart to scout the interior. Actually, it's a pretty good idea. This individual, after they open the account, has a legitimate reason for being in the bank. So there will be no questions for an, indiv an individual who has an account there walking around, looking around, and conversing with a different customers and employees. Uh, he can also be there when deliveries are made by the armored car services, possibly where he can see actually what they're doing and how they're doing it after the deliveries are made. 7.30 a.m., the day of the robbery. Mitchell and Stewart meet at the self-storage facility. Hey, good morning. 7.50 a.m., the bank employees begin filing in to prepare for business hours. The bank will open in one hour and 10 minutes. 8 a.m., the armored car leaves to pick up deposits from several nearby stores. 8.10, the Gainesville police bomb. operator receives a bomb. Can you tell me what time it's going to go off? His target, a junior high school in Northeast it's Gainesville, gonna go off in, 10 in the same police district Sir? as the bank. Hello? 8.22, the armored car guards arrive at the bank, swelling its total deposits on hand to $300,000. Simultaneously, patrol cars are dispatched to the site of the bomb threat, 32 blocks from the bank. Police now believe that Patrick Mitchell phoned in the false alarm as a diversionary tactic. 8.25 a.m., Mitchell and Stewart make their move. either going to shoot somebody or he's going to take someone hostage. I was very frightened. I remembered laying um, on the floor in the back. I kept thinking, I'll never see my husband or my children again. Um, I started to cry. I remember thinking that I was he was going to shoot me in the back. Keep your hands up, and no one will get hurt. This is a bomb. Nobody move, and it won't go off. As the two men flee, Mitchell drops a bag containing $28,000. Nevertheless, their take for the day is nearly half a million dollars. A bomb is a phony, but it buys valuable escape time. 8.40 AM, a woman who works at the storage facility sees Mitchell drive away, a rack full of clothes hung across the back seat. It is the last sighting of Patrick Michael Mitchell in Gainesville. Two months after the Gainesville robbery, Johnny Salazar Stewart was apprehended. Despite his innocent plea, he was tried and convicted for his role in the robbery and is today serving a 40-year sentence. A year after the robbery, 
Patrick Mitchell's Cadillac was found abandoned in a storage facility in Tallahassee, 150 miles from Gainesville. The car was clean of evidence, but Mitchell did leave nine cookbooks in the back seat. During the last two years, Mitchell has been sighted in Texas, Georgia, and Alabama. However, he is Canadian, and authorities believe he could have returned to Canada. His last known alias was Johnny Grant. I think it's imperative that uh, we find Patrick Michael Mitchell because I don't believe that uh, he'll be stopping with uh, the Gainesville robbery. Based on his previous activities in the past 11 years and his uh, hit frequency, I believe that uh, it's not if he's going to hit, but when he's going to hit. Next, the poignant saga of a little boy torn from his family during the Depression. Perhaps you can help reunite him with his brothers and sisters. Dillon Vale, Ohio, 1929. The darkest days of the Great Depression. For an eight-year-old farm boy named Frank, the hard times common to all Americans were especially cruel. Here's your bucket, Pa. Get on in the I had the chickens to feed and the grass to cut and chores to do, and of course I was busy. I didn't mind that so much, because I'd like to have been fed afterward, though. <laughs> For as far back as he can remember, Frank's hardships went Frank. beyond his thankless chores. Frank, have you fed the chickens yet? What have you been doing? You're such a lazy boy. This whole barn has to be clean. This new hay I has was to be beaten. spread, and those chickens have to be fed. I went so hungry, no the smell of food me? made That's me sick. No supper for you. I wasn't allowed in the house. I'd sleep at the barn most of the time, or with the dog. I was bitter, angry and a very upset young man, to say the least. By age nine, Frank's life had completely disintegrated. His parents informed him that he wasn't even their son and ordered him off the farm and out of their lives. Frank was told that his real parents didn't want him either. They had turned him over to the state welfare department just days after he was born. Frank was left to fend for himself. He had no family and no idea who he really was. The search for a missing family and one's true identity can be a difficult ordeal. Many times, years of research end with disappointment in the dust-covered files of some county record department. For those who do succeed, the solution can sometimes be more painful than the quest. When a child discovers he was abandoned by parents who simply didn't care. This was a fear that haunted nine-year-old Frank whose search for the truth would last more than half a century. After being put out of his home, Frank was shuffled from state institutions to foster families and back again. I was a ward of the state of Ohio. I ate at the soup kitchens. I stole food off in front of stores. Just to eat. No, I, I was not a thief. I didn't know anything about my parents. I was told all types of stories, like the family deserted me. I just was lost. Frank? Frank? As a teenager, Frank's troubles continued. Did you hear my question? Uh... Did you read your homework last night? The belief night? that his birth parents had willfully abandoned him left Frank dispirited and aimless. Frank, this is the third time in two weeks. You're going to stay after school and write the entire chapter on pronouns until you finish. But at 16, his life took an unexpected turn. A concerned social worker confirmed that Frank was not his real name. He had been born Victor Scheiman. The counselor also made a promise. If Frank applied himself and stayed in school, his real parents would be in the audience when he received his diploma. They told me my name was Victor Scheiman. I had a family that he would see that my parents and that would be there on my graduation day. 
And I buckled down and went to work. Brad Carney. The day Frank had worked so hard for finally came. He was going to meet his real family. Frank asked that he officially be graduated Victor Scheinman. It was the first time he used his real name. Victor Scheinman. I thought if my parents were in the audience, they would hear the name and they would respond. Lisa Goldblatt. Nobody showed up. Andy Robinson. And it was turned out to be one of the sorriest days of my life. Tina Marie Miller. I wrote to the Bureau of Charities, the Welfare Department, State of Ohio. And the answer they got, uh, that I received, that nothing could be found, they knew very little, and that my family had just disappeared without a trace. So I gave up. At a complete dead end, Victor had no choice but to move ahead with his life. In the 1950s, he married Eleanor Kell and started a family of his own. For 34 years, Victor all but abandoned the hope of finding his family. But in 1984, Victor learned of an organization in Reynoldsburg, Ohio, called Reunite, a support group for people searching for lost loved ones. An old school chum told me about this group, and I thought, well, what have I got to lose? Uh, a little bit of time? I can spare that. So I went, and I was very amazed. My name is Victor Scheiman. I was born September the 5th. 1921 in Alliance, Ohio. Victor told the group the story of his childhood. My mother, my father, that evening, he met amateur genealogist mother. Rose Murphy. I've been searching for them all this man years. has spent his entire I, life, 60 this, plus years, without any knowledge of his history. And, and I couldn't believe that that could be true. And it, it just, it, it went cross greens to everything I believe in because I think everyone has the right to their history. Rose Murphy was determined to find Victor's family and solve the puzzle which had eluded Victor his entire life. She began sifting through a labyrinth of state adoption records, county welfare files, and old newspapers. Incredibly, less than a week later, she discovered the obituary of a Hungarian immigrant named Lena Shimon. Lena had died in 1921, just hours after giving birth to her 11th child, the baby's name, Victor. And I contacted a Hungarian language professor. He said that he would venture to, to guess and would probably be right that the family name was actually Simon, a common Hungarian family name, but pronounced by a Hungarian spoken person and heard by an English ear would be spelled as Shimon or Shaman or, or any other forms of spelling depending upon the person hearing it. Within 20 minutes, I had located Victor's original birth certificate that had sat here for 64 years. They hadn't caught it because they're searching for it as the Scheiman family rather than the Simon family. Information found in the obituary and birth certificate enabled Rose to reconstruct the events surrounding Victor's birth. Victor's father, Dan Simon, had worked for the railroad in Alliance, Ohio, just 100 miles from where Victor had grown up. Just before Victor's birth, a tragic series of events was set into motion that would separate him from his family. and Dan Simon's ankle were shattered. He was rushed to the hospital. That afternoon, Dan's wife, Lena, went into labor. Push, that's it. You've got to help me. Good. I can imagine a tremendous struggle going on physically as well as emotionally in that room as Lena gave life to Victor. 
and lost her own in the process. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff... According to her obituary, Mr. Simon now was taken from the hospital to the funeral. With now this broken ankle, the father being totally unable to care for the child, Welfare placed the child uh, for foster care and in fact indicated in their records that the father agreed to that foster care only with great regret. Well, here he is. Strong and healthy boy. His name is Victor. We've decided to call him Frank. Frank. I Frank feel very strongly name. that his father returned to welfare after he recuperated and was out of the hospital and said, you know, you have my son, Victor Simon, I want my son back. He could very possibly have been told we don't have anybody by that name, which they didn't have. They had a Victor Emmanuel Scheiman. They didn't have a Victor Simon in their records. Victor Scheiman can take comfort in knowing that he was not truly an unwanted child, but rather a victim of an unlikely conspiracy of events. However, several pieces to the puzzle of his life are still missing. I hope that I meet some member of my family to know that I belong. I want to know what happened. I want my children to have their side of the family, like uncles, brothers, sisters, and so on. I just want to see somebody and talk to somebody that I belong to. When we return, a brutal attack leaves a mother and her two daughters dead. A woman's husband is wanted for murder. Las Vegas, city of big dreams and high rollers. This desert town has attracted every kind of crook and con man. However, during the last decade, the dry climate and limitless entertainment have also begun to attract a large retirement community. Frank Allen, a Los Angeles businessman, bought his dream retirement home in 1986. He was located in an elegant gated community 10 miles from downtown Las Vegas. As a temporary measure, he rented the house to another family, maintaining a room for himself as well for his frequent business trips to Nevada. But Frank Allen had no idea that Joe Smith, the man who was renting his house, had an unsavory past. Joe Weldon Smith, who called himself a real estate investor, had a long history as a con man and had once been convicted of attempted grand theft he lived in the Nevada house with his wife, Judith, and her two daughters from a previous marriage, 12-year-old Christy and 20-year-old Wendy. On October 6, 1990, Frank Cannon expected to have the house to himself. Joe Smith has said that he and his family would be out of town for a few days. Instead of a restful weekend, Allen had stepped into a nightmare. I locked the door behind me and went up the top of the steps and unlocked the bedroom and went in. I started undressing, took off my jacket, shirt, tie, and suddenly stopped in my track and said, something is wrong. I said, I don't know what it is, but something is wrong. grabbed him at the wrist on, on that uh, arm, his right arm, and that's when I shook him and I said, Joe, what in the hell are you trying to do? And then it was clear to me that he was trying to murder me. Coming down the steps, I said, now I've locked myself in with these double dead boats and I don't have time to reach for a key. So I ran across the foyer into the living room, dining room, and sure enough, he went the opposite direction to head me off in the kitchen, and I doubled back for the front door. I still didn't think I had time to fumble for keys, so I went straight through the door.
he stood in the door and glared at me and then walked back uh, to, in the direction of the bar. And I drove the, my car up to the guard gate and said to the guard, call the police, there's a man in my house. Joe! Ten minutes later, local police arrived at the house, expecting to find Joe Smith still inside. They quickly made their way from the living room to a downstairs bedroom. Joe, come on out, Joe. They thought they had cornered Joe Smith hiding under a blanket. Instead, they were confronted with a tragic scene of 12-year-old Christy Cox, Smith's stepmother. She had been strangled and bludgeoned to death. It was obvious that she had been dead for quite some time. She had several wounds to the face and to her head. In the next bedroom, they forcefully entered that also, and that's when Wendy Cox was found laying beside the bed. She had approximately 32 wounds to her head and hands, defensive wounds to her hands, and she had also been strangled. Officers went upstairs, uh, searched the open rooms, the game room and so forth, and then went to the master bedroom, entered that, the doors were closed, they entered that bedroom, and that's when they found Judith Smith lying in the bed. Judith Smith, Joe's wife, and mother of the two girls, had also been bludgeoned to death. Yeah, Police like, later determined yeah, that the three John victims had been dead for approximately 18 hours. Two hours after the bodies were discovered, Who is Smith this? telephoned his wife's daughter-in-law. It's Joe. He denied all involvement in the murders. Joe, what's going on? It's after four in the morning. Are you sitting down? Yes. I'm Approximately four thirty in the morning on October sixth, called her on the phone, told her that her what? mother and sisters had been murdered, and he had killed one of the people that did the killing, and knew who the other ones were. Where are you? It doesn't matter where I am right now. You just have to believe I had nothing to do with it. If I don't kill myself, I'm gonna find the guys who did it. I know who they are, and I'm gonna kill them. In my opinion, it was a ruse by Mr. Smith to get support from Judah Smith's family members and make them believe that he was not involved in the killings. Joe Smith fled in a gold Lincoln Continental with Vanity Nevada license plates reading Smitty II. He is wanted on three counts of murder and one count of attempted murder with a deadly weapon. Smith is 50 years old, six feet tall, and weighs 160 pounds. He has brown hair and brown eyes. He may be working in real estate. Police are still puzzled by what appears to have been a motiveless crime. By all accounts, a Smith's marriage was a happy one. Though Joe Smith was in dire financial straits, he was not named in his wife's will, nor did he have life insurance policies for her or her daughters. Authorities believe Smith may now be somewhere in the southwestern United States or Mexico. Just minutes after we profiled Smith's case, an anonymous viewer called our telecenter to report that the fugitive was living near Los Angeles, California. Smith was hiding out at this motel, but managed to escape before he could be apprehended. Once we established that Joe Willen Smith was in the Los Angeles area, we focused our attention to his brother, who we knew that he had close contact with. After five days of surveilling this brother, uh, we established where the suspect was residing. 20 minutes later, Joe Weldon Smith was arrested at another local motel where he was registered under an assumed name. Inside Smith's room, detectives recovered several credit and identification cards. Smith told police that he was in the process of creating a new identity. At the time of his arrest, Joe Smith indicated to me that he had seen the last airing of the Unsolved Mystery Program. He also told me that it was very tough being a fugitive, and he always knew that you know, someone would be knocking at the door one day. He was kind of glad it's all over at this point. Next, former residents claim that this house is haunted. But are the spirits friendly, evil, or just a figment of overactive imaginations? In the 
tiny hamlet of Fish Springs, Nevada, stands a 120-year-old Kansas-style farmhouse. It was originally built next to a graveyard in Virginia City and has been moved three times. Some people find it very odd that the house has managed to survive for more than a century. Others believe the explanation is simple. They say this house is haunted. I'd like to see it destroyed. I think it is a center point for spirits. The house is something keeping it alive. And I'd like to see it burn to the ground. I've always loved older homes, and I'm fascinated by them, by their building, and, and the fact that they have so much history that they've withstood all that time. I just feel like they have a memory of their own. Just like people, they can remember the past and things that have happened there. There's something about haunted houses that even the most skeptical among us finds difficult to resist. Perhaps it's because they bring back childhood memories of things that go bump in the night. Or perhaps we just like a good ghost story. This is a tale of two families, the Kelseys and the Robinsons. Both families believe they had supernatural encounters while they lived in the Nevada house. But the end result would be very different for each. Is this a story of a congenial and well-meaning spirit? Is it the tale of a fearsome poltergeist? Or is it simply a tale? You will no doubt have an opinion of your own. The Kelsey family bought the house on May 2nd, 1978, 100 years to the day after the man who built it had died. From the beginning, there was something eerie about the house. I felt like we had gotten more than we bargained for, and I wouldn't walk through the house in the dark at all for fear that I was gonna run into something something that wasn't supposed to be there. Just as you're getting to sleep, you would hear footsteps walking up and down the stairs. What's wrong? My husband would tell me that he heard a swishing noise, like the rustle of the old chiffon skirts was how he described it. it. Sounds like swishing, right? We got really scared, or I did anyway, thinking that Either there really was something happening in the house or we had just seen too many scary movies and my imagination was running wild because it was an old house. The Kelsey's daughter, Jennifer, who was then four years old, had an even more bizarre experience. I had just woken up for, for some reason, I don't know why. And I remember I rolled over and I looked at my bedroom door and I saw this little boy, and he looked like he was sad. And the man, he just looked like he was really concerned. And it was just only there for a few seconds, but then it, it just like disappeared, it was weird. They didn't look familiar to me at all, but the way they were looking at me it just seemed like they knew me. It's just really weird. For some reason, I keep thinking that the levitation was the same night that I saw him. It was. For some reason, I just combined the two together in memory, but I just remember laying there in my bed. It seemed like my whole bed was just like floating. After Jennifer told me what had happened, I was very scared that things were starting to happen that not aren't supposed to happen normally. And I told my husband about it. And he asked me if she was actually levitated. And I said, from what she was saying, that's what it sounded like. Jim and Susan Kelsey often heard strange footsteps approaching their daughter's bedroom. They were concerned for her safety. In desperation, the Kelseys decided to call in a local man, Daniel Martin, who had a reputation as a psychic. When I first talked to Mrs. Kelsey, uh, she was more concerned, uh, confused, because she didn't understand what was happening. After visiting the house, Martin returned to his home and put himself into a deep trance. Incredibly, Martin says that while he was in the trance, he met the Kelsey's ghost. I contacted an entity, appeared to me as a, as a sailing man. I mean, that's, that's what came to my mind, he had the mustache. 
And at that time, I asked him, who are you? And he told me his name was Samuel. And he told me at the time that the purpose, his purpose there was to protect the child. And he was there not to harm anybody. And I explained to him that he was frightening the family. And Samuel promised not to do these things in the future, not to frighten them by doing frightening things to them. Jennifer asked me, she said, does that mean he's going away? And I said, I don't know. And then a couple weeks later, things had quieted down, and she asked me if he had moved away. And I said, I didn't know. And she said, well, I don't think he did. She says, I think he's up in the attic. The Kelseys became convinced that their ghost, Samuel, was a spirit who meant them no harm. Three years later, in 1981, they moved to a more modern house nearby. The old home was leased to a potential buyer. By now, the Kelseys had three children, including an infant son. Hi right there. When my son was seven weeks old, I had taken some pictures of him, and I'd run out of flash, and I had the rest of the roll of film to use up. And so I decided to try to get the pictures taken of him anyway. And I propped him up on the love seat next to a lamp and with some stuffed animals around him and proceeded to take the rest of the roll of film, figuring there should be enough light. When I went to pick the pictures up, I opened them up and I pulled them out and there was a man on the first picture. And I thought, these aren't my pictures. So I went through them, and after that initial picture, everything in there, the roll was of my son. And I checked my negative, and the man was on it. The only way I can explain the photograph is that it is of our ghost Samuel, because my daughter had told me about three weeks earlier that she felt that he had moved with us, and I didn't believe her. And I just saw the picture of him, and it was his way of telling us that he had, in fact, moved with us. That was the only explanation there was. The mysterious photograph became front page news in Fish Springs. Interestingly, nobody in town recognized the man in the picture. Unsolved Mysteries brought in photographic expert Vernon Miller to analyze the snapshot. I can't uh, say precisely how this image was formed. There's not enough evidence. The image is three-dimensional and has uh, reflected qualities. Where the skin is tight against the skull, it's brighter and there's highlights there. Uh, a manifestation of a ghost is usually thought of as transparent or self-illuminant, and this is definitely reflected light. I detected uh, lines, horizontal lines, across the, the image. In conclusion, I would say that uh, Samuel's ghost was made off of a large television screen. The picture of Samuel is not a fake. There's a lot of things that can't be explained, and I just think this is one of them. I know I can't explain how somebody came out in my picture that wasn't there when I, when I snapped it. The Kelseys insist they have never photographed their television screen. Could the picture be a simple accident, even a hoax? Or could it really be a ghost? For 15 months, the new tenants at the Fish Springs house reported nothing out of the ordinary. But then in October of 1989, the house was rented to another family. Steve and Mona Robinson knew nothing about the house's ghostly past. Soon, however, the Robinson family was caught up in the middle of its very own ghost story. I felt that there was ghosts in the house, but then I kept telling myself no. And things started happening more and more. The footsteps, the bangs. I'd bring it up to Steve once in a while, and he would say, no, there's got to be some reason why all this is happening. You know, it's an old house. Um, we even thought about pipes. You know, we thought of all kinds of things. The Robinsons became extremely concerned when their 11-year-old son, Garrett, began to have frightening experiences. I started hearing noises <laughs> upstairs, like indoors, walking, bangings and stuff. After I heard the laughing, I went up to the top of the stairs. 
for myself. I was scared though because I heard all his footsteps the other day. And there was a whole bunch of um, walking around wings while I was upstairs. I started hearing humming. Three different, three different like voices. A higher one, a yellow one, a lower one. I then ran out the door. When I got out, I when I was inside my driveway, there was all this banging of the screen door. And then, for some reason, I looked over to the window and I saw this old guy, and then he had this grin on his face. A smirky grin, not like a real mean one, like he was trying to be mean. Six-year-old Miles was the next child to fall under the spell of the house. I remember one night I was getting lifted out of bed. I got lifted up pretty high, and um, I didn't know what was happening. I just got lifted up. Well, I had told my husband then that I didn't want to live there. And he said, well, he goes, they're not going to hurt us. He wasn't afraid. Finally, Mona Robinson reached the end of her rope. My husband and I were getting ready to go to bed, and I couldn't sleep. And I could hear bangs in the hallway, like coming down the stairs. Then all of a sudden, I heard right behind my bed in a man's voice, call me bitch. It was um, a mad voice, mad, angry. I thought, you know, that she was going nuts, but at the same time, I believed her. She refused to go to bed. She was always afraid that once we got into bed, the noises would start. So she'd stay up all night long. I felt like they were trying to drive me crazy. I would never believe anybody that told me what has happened to me. I wouldn't believe them. I do believe now because we had it happen to us. You never believe anything like that until it happens to you. January 31st, 1990, the Robinsons moved out of the house less than four months after they had moved in. The Kelseys, who still owned the house, once again called in Daniel Martin. Once again, he put himself into a trance. Once again, he claimed he met ghosts, this time different ones. At that time, I encountered three entities, two men and one woman. My first impressions when I approached these entities were that they were of the Virginia City era back in the old days. These entities were not destructive, they were just cantankerous, kind of a rowdy little gang of troublemakers. It had been and still was. Martin says he asked the spirits to leave the house, but it was too late to do the Robinsons any good. They were already settled in a new home far away from hauntings and poltergeists. To most of us, this saga sounds incredible, but the Kelseys and the Robinsons take it very seriously. It is interesting to note that last year, the Kelseys sold the house to a couple with two children who bought with full knowledge of the stories of spirits and haunting. The new owners have been in the home for eight months and have reported no unusual phenomena. Perhaps ghosts, like many other things, exist only in the eye of the beholder. Perhaps. On our next Unsolved Mysteries, for a lonely widow, Eric Kessler is like a dream come true. Charming, elegant, and cosmopolitan, he has the perfect qualities for a potential husband and a master con man. His elaborate schemes have allegedly netted more than $150,000 from at least four vulnerable women. Authorities are convinced that his list of victims is much longer and still growing. Join me 
for our next edition of Unsolved Mysteries.